the partner from Mexico City, the stranger dead in Nevada, and the man with the cauliflower ear. All added up to a corpse on a concrete floor. But I couldn't figure why until I found out there was one name above all that had to be remembered. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Name to Remember. big clock at the far end of the Beverly Room cocktail lounge with the opaque glass ice cubes where there should have been numbers said it was 20 after 5. That meant my new client, Eddie Millett, was late. So sitting at an uncomfortable mushroom for two, I waited and worked on a long drink and stared down into the mirrored top of my table. I stopped staring when the reflection in the tabletop changed from red ceiling to gray Hamburg and pale blue eyes in an almost friendly face. I looked up to find easygoing Eddie Millett looking about as he had been a year ago. Dapper in draped flannel, carnation attached, and a thin smile on thinner lips. He sat down, took off his hat, and shook hands all in one quick motion. And I knew he was either in trouble, a hurry, or both. Marlowe, business. Business. You gotta find the nut who's been following me for the last couple of days. He's big. A lot of muscle under a t-shirt and a kind of jacket like the Dodgers wear when they're warming up, you know what I mean? I can't figure out what this bird's after. That bothers me. All the time, he's like it. What? Hanging around. Oh. And if I go for him, he runs. So what I want you to do is, uh, I, you get next to him and the answer to this tag. Here. 50, 70, 80, 100 bucks. Enough, Phil? Enough. You know, Eddie, the law might do this for you for free. Yeah, for John Doe, they might. But Eddie Millett's oh. another story, Molly. You know what I mean? Today, I got a respectable business. War surplus. But the cops... They only remember me as a guy who once did time for being careless with other people's dough. Yeah. Besides, I'm in a hurry. My two partners, Lou Tripp and Ruth Dunn, she's also my girl. They're coming back to town tonight. I'd like to spend some time with both of them, without interruption. What do you mean, girl, Eddie? You and that pretty wife I've heard about split up? Yeah, I'm soon for divorce right now. Tina and I never should have been, Marlo. We ne- yeah, I need someone who's softer, more honest than understanding. Know what I mean? Mm. Now, take this here, Ruth. Uh, can I help Gee- you, sir? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, scotch. No buzz. Uh, make it a double. Very well, sir. This Ruth Marlowe, she's different. Uh-huh. Good head for business, sweet kid at the same time. Like, for instance, the letter I got from her today. She and Lou were both in Mexico City. She's got all the dope on the deal we're working on, plus the fact she's worrying about me. Now, that should bring us right back to T-shirt. Remember, where do I start, Eddie? At uh, the only place I know of, Marlowe. Yesterday, I kind of turned the tables on this guy, trailed him down to the corner of Wilshire and Weston. But he got away in the middle of a lot of traffic, you know what I mean? In a car? Huh? Car. Oh, no, we were both walking. No. no I figured from his bill and that T-shirt, he could work in one of these health clubs around it. You find out, then come to my place on Hoover before eight, huh? By the way, he's got black curly hair and uh, one ear is all, all banged up uh, cauliflower-like. Uh, right one. Anything else? No, Eddie, I'll see you. Know what I mean? Huh? Two hours after I'd left Eddie Millett, I checked with a half a dozen hooray for health clubs in the neighborhood, smelled a lot of liniment, and came away with nothing more than distended nostrils. So at 7.30, I pointed my car toward 8400 North Hoover in the hope that my client could give me something else to go on. The Millett home was well-groomed and sat sedately behind 50 rolling yards of carefully clipped hedge and said the gardener must have gone to Barber's College. So when I leaned against the front doorbell, I expected Eddie in at least a silk lapel smoking jacket with slippers to match. When the door swung open, I got a surprise. Because I was greeted instead by a lot of white T-shirt, and in front of that and coming straight from my head was a fist the size of a muskmelon. Oh! Okay, private detective hired by Eddie Millett in the Beverly Room. Get her up. Don't so much as smile crooked or I'll twist your arm in two. Uh, uh, What is it you want? Oh, one thing, a chance to bust you in the nose. (laughs) What nerve. Yeah? Listen, stupid, if I had the time, I'd tie your arm into a square knot, then rip it off at the hinges and throw it away. But right now, I've got what I came for. I'm in a hurry, so you're real lucky. How about Eddie Millett, Muscles? How lucky is he? Very. He's inside, resting. Just like you're gonna be, Mr. <laughs> I 
By the time I got back to my feet and had my right arm unscrewed to where I could reach across my chest and my shoulder holster, a T-shirt was gone. So I started into the house and what I knew was going to be a slightly beat-up client. When I turned on the lights and found nothing in the kitchen, bathroom, or bedroom, I began to worry a little more. I got to the den and saw that the drawers of a desk that were turned inside out, but there was still no Eddie. I opened a side door and started out for the patio, which ran along the front of the house. But then at the staccato report of high heels coming up the flagstone path that led to the front door, I stopped and waited. When the lady, who was a quiet face and quiet clothes, came to a halt in the open doorway, puzzled and called Eddie's name out loud. I figured this had to be Ruth Dunn, girlfriend and partner out of Mexico City. So I walked back through the house to the living room. Eddie Millette, are you playing a game with me? Uh, Why, who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Philip Marlowe, Miss Dunn. I was hired by your boyfriend because he was worried about a bunch of muscles in a T-shirt with curly black hair, a cauliflower ear, and a brain you could drop through the hole in a lifesaver. Mean anything to you? Well, no, it doesn't. But where's Eddie, Mr. Marlowe, and why is the front door open like this, and why are all the lights on? In that order, I don't know where Eddie is. Front door's open because that's where T-Shirt and I played Ben, the private detective, and all the lights are on because I was looking for Eddie. But he's not here any place? The bedroom, the kitchen? So far, no. Come on in here, see if this desk in the den adds for you, maybe. Drawers have been slightly rearranged by a very heavy hand. Hey, incidentally, T-Shirt was bragging about getting what he'd come for just as he collapsed me for the second time, so if you... Oh, the letters. They're gone. What letters? The ones I wrote to Eddie while I was on the road. He always kept them here in the bottom drawer. Were they business or pleasure? Well, business mostly, but I... I did talk of other things, too. Yeah, I know. Eddie mentioned that when he told me about you and Lou Tripp being due back tonight. Oh, by the way, where is Tripp? Well, I don't know. He left me in Mexico City the day before yesterday and said he'd be here tonight at the latest. Oh, surely, Marla, you don't think that Lou had anything to do with this? Could be. Letters are part business. And part love. So I'd say that the only person who could possibly be behind this is Mrs. Millette. Tina? Yes. And for the oldest and best reason in the world, Marlowe. Jealousy. Tina'd do anything to make Eddie and me unhappy. She could twist the innocent wording of those letters so that any divorced judge would see things her way. She's cruel, Marlowe, and she... Marlowe. Hmm? Under that door there that leads to the garage... It's blood, Marlowe. Stay over there, Ruth. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, are you... Oh, no. Oh, Marlowe, he... He's dead. Isn't he? Yeah, honey. I'm afraid he is. Eddie Millett was dead. Real dead. Oh, Eddie. The right side of his head crushed him. Eddie. Next to him and on the edge of the ugly pool of blood that had seeped under the door was the grease-coated tire iron that had done the job. I turned Ruth away and it wasn't until we were back in the living room and she'd stopped sobbing long enough to take the double shot of brandy that I'd forced on her that I started for the telephone and a call of Detective Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide. But before I could pick up the receiver, it went off. Hello? Now, this is Lieutenant Ibarra at police headquarters. I've Ibarra? Come... Huh? <laughs> How great can service be? This is Marlowe. I was just going to call you. Did I dial your office number by mistake, Marlon? No, no mistake, Lieutenant. I'm at Eddie Millett's. I've been working for him since this afternoon. What's up? Why the call? A dead man named Ellis Clay in a motel outside of Carson City, Nevada, Phil. Yeah? It looks like an accidental explosion in his room there, and the best the sheriff has for identification other than his name in the city, Los Angeles, is a blank sheet of letterhead paper from Eddie Millett's war surplus outfit. So I thought Millett might be able to help us out. Is he there? Yeah. And dead, Ibarra. Huh? Murdered with a tire iron sometime in the last hour. What? Mm-hmm. Any idea who did it? A muscle man in a T-shirt, maybe. But at the moment, Ibarra, the motive seems to be a little mixed. Say, wait a minute. I may be able to help you on that Nevada guy. Mm -hmm. Ruth. Huh. Ruth, do you know anything about a man named Clay in Carson City? He had Eddie's address on him when he was killed in an accident. Uh, Clay? Yeah, yeah. In Nevada? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Phil. No, I don't. No. Hello, Ibarra. Yes? The girl here who was one of Eddie's partners never heard of him. But that's unimportant now. What I am interested in is Millette's death. What's the address out there? And why It's 8400 so North Hoover. North what? Hoover, as in vacuum cleaner. But look, if it's all the same to you, Ebar, I'd like to move. And I think if I do it fast enough, I've got an even chance of catching up with this T-shirt. Okay? Well, all right, Marlowe, but don't forget, we've got a couple of thousand policemen here in L.A. Just in case you can't 
Captain. Yeah, yeah. Myself. Goodbye, Vara. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth, honey, why don't you go to your own place and try to take it easy, huh? When I talk to Ibarra again, I'll tell him where you can be found. All right, Phil. But where are you going? To the only place that adds now, Tina Millett's. You know where it is? Yeah. The cameo house on Rexford Drive in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. Also, if it's, if it's any help, she she drives a new cream-colored Nash. But Marlo, be careful. Tina may be the one who hired that man in the T-shirt. Yeah, I know. And that, honey, is exactly what I'm banking on. I'll call you. After I got the vital statistics on where I could reach Ruth later on, I piled into my car and headed for Beverly Hills in the cameo house, which was six stories of white stone and glass brick. Tina Millette managed to uh, scrimp by with half of the top floor, and a couple of minutes later, when I got out of the old mirror elevator, walked to her door, rang and waited. I was wondering what kind of a reception I'd get. But when the door opened, I stopped wondering and started concentrating. You, uh, you want something? Oh, in something the texture of spun smoke rings. It stood five feet six inches over the threshold and must have weighed in at close to 120. With every inch a thing of beauty and every palm just in the right place. I asked you if you wanted something. Do you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I mean, <laughs> the name's Philip Marlowe, Mrs. Millett. I'm, I'm a private detective your husband hired this afternoon. Oh, why don't you let me in like a good little girl, huh? Because that's something I'm not. Now, get out of here before I call the police. Who are probably on their way up here right now. Oh? Your husband's dead, Mrs. Millett. He was murdered. He... Eddie murdered? Yeah, yeah. Now, do you still mind if I come in? No. Of course not. I... I don't know what to say. Oh, that's a trite line. What was that? I said you're acting and doing a bum job of it. Why, I ought to slap your face. Or call your boy with the muscles and have him go back to work on my arm for a while. What are you talking about? A lad in a white T-shirt who killed Eddie and then stole a bunch of letters that were going to help you lie your way through a countersuit for divorce. It would leave Eddie both broke and embarrassed. You don't make sense, bright boy. No? First of all, I don't know who you're talking about. And second, if I were going to file such a countersuit... Why would I want my husband killed first? Maybe you didn't. We all make mistakes, Mrs. Millett. Which is only one man's opinion. Hmm. So why don't I just pick up my coat here and let the perfect gentleman escort me to the nearest police station? All right, it's a date. I see you bowl quite a bit, Tina. Good enough to win that cup there from the Maplewood Alleys on Wilshire near Weston. <laughs> Eddie figured a health club and I went right along. Never thought about the bowling alley near there and I, uh, oh. Yes, Marlowe? You were saying something? Uh, yes, I was, but the little gun in your hand made me lose my place. Marlowe, I don't believe that Eddie's dead. Nor do I believe that you work for him at all. For my money, you're just a not-so-smart boy who was hired by that hussy Ruth Dunn. She's going to need an army of private detectives before I get through, and I mean that. Now back up through those doors and get out onto the fire escape. While you do what? Well, I find out exactly what's going on. I get out there. It's six long floors to the ground, Marlowe. And I hope with the first step you take that you trip, fall all the way, and break your neck. Goodbye, private detective. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first... Just a little later on CBS Tonight, you'll hear Sing It Again's Master of Ceremonies, Dan Seymour, giving a perfect characterization of a man going crazy. The reason? Well, Dan's got the biggest, hottest news in the history of quiz shows ready for announcement right after someone knocks off tonight's $20,500 Phantom Voice mystery. So be sure to hear Sing It Again tonight when it comes to you at 10 o'clock Eastern Time on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Name to Remember. When Tina Millette prodded me out onto the fire escape through a pair of French doors, slammed them shut and snapped the lock, there was a cold look in her smoky eyes and an unwavering potential about the snub-nosed gun clenched in her hand and pointed straight at my belt buckle that melted all the gambler out of me fast. So I watched quietly as she backed across the room to the hall door and out. 
I knew my chances of climbing down six flights of iron fire escape in time to head her off was an idiot's dream. So, <clears throat> kicked a panel out of one of the doors, reached through and finally got it unlocked. And I went back inside to the phone. Since the vixen was on the prowl with a gun in her fist, I figured the least I could do was pass the word along. Hello? Ruth, this is Marlowe. Oh, Phil. Have you found the letters? Not yet, but never mind that now. You got something more important to worry about because your guess on Eddie's ex-wife, Tina, was right on the button. You mean she's the one who's really after the letters? Yeah, yeah, that muscle man in the T-shirt is just doing a heavy work for her. And I've got a good idea that he's connected with a Maplewood bowling alley on Wilshire. Where are you now, Phil? In Tina's apartment, alone. I just lost a small debate with her. And get this, Ruth. She hates you, and she's the type who hates hard. Yeah. When she left here, she had a gun, and the chances are at least 50-50 that she's coming your way. So keep your doors locked and stay away from windows, savvy? Yeah, okay, Phil. Oh, oh, one more thing before I shove off. Has Millette's partner, Lou Tripp, shown yet? No. At least he hasn't called me. Uh-huh. But where are you going, Phil? At Bowling Alley on Wilshire. Only this time, I'm swinging first. <laughs> Maplewood was a small and dusky combination six-lane bowling alley restaurant bar and magazine stand and cigar store, all slightly down at the heel and more than hungry for business. Only two alleys were in use and a lanky postgraduate delinquent with a mouthful of gum and a complexion one tone greener than his eye shade was the only houseman in sight. He looked up and watched me as I moved over to the bulletin board where a bank of photographs were tacked up, picturing the champions of the uh, local league. Sure enough, there in the top row and holding a bowling ball that had more expression than his face was the pile of muscles in a T-shirt, which the caption tagged as one Sid Sawyer. So I walked over to the counter where the house man sat and made like a one-man fan club. What's your problem, Mac? I, uh, I see Sid's up there with the champs. Uh, is he around tonight? I wouldn't know. Uh, where can I get in touch with him? I wouldn't have the faintest idea, Mac. He works here, doesn't he? Yeah, off and on. But you don't know where he lives or what his phone number is, huh? Well, you're just beginning to get the idea. Uh, come hey, here, you... Hey, cut it out, will you? Take your hands off uh, You get me. the idea and get it fast unless you want your teeth crammed down your throat. Where does Sawyer live? Hey, now, wait a minute, mister. Take it easy. I'll tell you. He, he's got a room over on Shadow Street, 6340, upstairs. He don't have no phone. All right, that's better. Is he there now? I I think so. But, gee, I don't know why everybody is so interested in Sid Sawyer all of a sudden. Who else is interested? Some babe called a couple of minutes ago. An old friend, she said. That's the reason I give you the store. Yeah. Honest. You see... Sid don't like to be interrupted when he's entertaining old friends. Is that so? Well, this is one party that's going to get crowded whether he likes it or not. 6340 Shadow Street was a top heavy stale gingerbread house. Left over from the days when Los Angeles was a stopover between Spanish missions. I got out of my car and started across the street toward the door when I saw Tina Millette's cream-colored sedan sticking out through a tangle of overgrown brush in the driveway. Which meant I was still in time for the big reunion. I went inside and up the steps to Sawyer's door. There was a light on and movement, but no voices. I slipped my gun out of its holster, knocked lightly, and stepped back. When the knob turned slowly and the door cracked open. I kicked hard! Hey, don't move, muscles. I'm returning your visit. Where's Tina? Who's Tina? Look, her car's outside in the driveway. She's here after the letters, isn't she? What letters? You're nuts. I don't know what you're talking about. And these suitcases, you wouldn't be skipping town, would you? Listen, Shamus, you're barking up the wrong tree. I don't know anything, get me? Yeah? Okay, Sawyer, if you insist, we'll do it the hard way. <coughs> that squares us for that arm-twisting job you gave me. Now we'll start all over again, even. Get up! Come on! Quit hitting me with that gun. I don't enjoy doing it, so the faster you talk, the sooner I'll stop. Where's Tina? I don't know hey. what you do. Now make it straight. I haven't got all night. All right, all right. No more. That's better. She... She came and picked up the letters, and she left again. Five minutes before you got here. Five minutes, you're lying. Take a look out that window and tell me why your car's still outside. I don't know what... It... Where? I don't see it. In the driveway next door. It... Holy smoke, it's gone. All right, Sawyer, that means I can spare 30 seconds for the rest of the story, so make it fast. She told you little Eddie Millett is dead. That's why you're blowing town, isn't it? No. Now, wait a minute, Marlowe. I never killed him. I just knocked him down. Sure, sure, on a concrete floor with a tire iron. No, Skip I Skip it! Those letters you got were written by Ruth Dunn. Was Tina heading for Ruth when she left here? I don't know. Come on, Sawyer, I'm running out of time. 
Won't do you any good to try to protect Tina now? Oh, no. We'll see about that, Marlo. Why, you... I hope Tina was worth a broken jaw. Good night, muscles. I took a close look at Sawyer to be sure he was down for the long count. Then I stepped out the door and into a whispering circle of wide-eyed neighbors who had heard the fight and had already called the police. I flashed my identification, issued a battle order to the three huskiest ones, and then ran down the stairs to my car. I made it from Shadow Street to Ruth's bungalow on Normandy in something under five minutes, but still not fast enough. Because when I ground to a stop in front of the place, I saw that same cream-colored sedan already there, close to a side door. I belted up the walk and was halfway to the house when I heard it. <laughs> made me sick. Went up to a front window where the only light was burning and looked in. The room had been torn up and in the middle of it all, face down on the tangled carpet was Tina Millette. And it was Ruth who was slumped in a chair, her face buried in her arms and sobbing hysterically. And still dangling from her hand was Tina's snub-nosed revolver. She looked up as I walked in. Oh, oh Phil. Phil, I, I killed her, Phil. I know, I know. Come on, baby, take it easy. It's going to be all right. Oh, she had this, she had this gun. She was crazy, Phil. Yeah, she was yeah. going to kill me. I I don't know what happened. I struggled with her, and then I, I realized I had the gun in my hand. I, I shot her. I didn't even think. I just pulled the trigger on you. She, she's dead, Phil. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Ruth. Leave it alone. It's over now. Now try to get hold of yourself. She brought the letters back. They're on the desk. She said that they didn't matter anymore. That she was mixed up in Eddie's murder, and there was nothing left for her but to run. She said she. She took the gun out of her purse and said I'd ruined her whole life and that she was going to be sure I got what was coming to me before she left. But that's when it happened, Phil. I was so scared I went out of my head, I guess. Yeah, we better call Ibarra, honey. I think we can explain it all now, except... except one thing. Uh, Ruth, do you remember that guy Ibarra called us about? The one who was killed in Nevada? He... Ellis Clay? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Clay... I've had the feeling all night that some way his death is tied up with all this. It's only a hunch, but something seems to be missing. What is it, Phil? What's missing? I don't know yet. Look, honey, I want to take a look at these letters. You go call the police, will you? It was a long shot, but while Ruth went down the hall to phone the police, I flipped through the bundle of envelopes that had caused all the trouble. And the long shot began to pay off. I could hear Ruth talking to a desk sergeant as I picked up Tina's revolver. I broke it open. But then a pair of headlights and a red spot of a police car flashed in the driveway, and I knew that he borrowed, figured out a few things for himself. I put the gun down on the table again, told Ruth to forget her call, and when the lieutenant came in, Ruth and I together explained everything that had happened right up to Tina Millette's body on the floor. Well, it's quite a mess, isn't it? Anyway, this part of it looks like a clear case of self-defense. Right, Marlon? Exactly right, Ibarra. It looks like self-defense, only there's something missing. Something missing? What do you mean, Marlo? At least three letters from that packet there. I think they're the last ones you wrote to Eddie, Ruth. They're gone. Oh, that's strange. I, I don't understand it. And another missing item is Lou Tripp, Eddie's partner. He didn't show up tonight because I think he's in Nevada, dead under the name of Clay. What? Marlo, you you mean that Lou and that, that, that Clay were really the same man? Mm-hmm. Look, what are you getting at with all this theory, Marlo? You'll see, Barra. Lou Tripp was double-crossing Eddie Millette. Lou went to Mexico with Ruth here, only he left early and flew to Nevada to close a big deal under the name of Clay. Meanwhile, some letters were written from Mexico to preserve the illusion that Lou Tripp was still there. Understand what I mean, Ruth? Yes, sir. I think so. Yeah. And then the unexpected happened. Lou, identified as Clay, died accidentally in Nevada. That meant that sooner or later those letters would be exposed as lies. Right, Ruth? Marlo, that gun on the table, watch it! Too late, Lieutenant. Now, don't move. Either one of you. You haven't got a chance, baby. Stay back. Please, Phil, I don't want to kill you, but I will if you come one step closer. Stay back, Marlo. She means it. Look, baby, you're licked. Marlo. It was a good try, but you lost. Stay back. Why not go out? Like a lady. Oh, shoot. <sighs> oh what difference does it make now? <laughs> Well, Marla, when she cracked, she really went to pieces and told the whole story. Yeah? 
Yeah, she and Lou Tripp were working together all right. When he died in Nevada, the lie she told him those letters put her in a tight jam with Eddie, see? So when she found Eddie unconscious in his garage, she finished him. But when she went for the letters, Sid Sawyer scared her off. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Incidentally, the state is going to give Sawyer a long vacation in one of their better institutions. Good, good. What happened down at Sawyer's place, Ibarra? You know, Ruth had a lot of nerve, Marlon. Yeah. She found Tina Millette's car at Sawyer's, so she waited in the back seat until Tina came out with the letters. Then she sapped her, drove the car to her house, and faked that slick self-defense setup. And she still doesn't know where she made the mistake that caught her. Hey, where was it, Phil? Well, she was being real cagey, Barra. She decided it was too dangerous to write the name Clay down any place, so she made it a name to remember. And she did. But too well. What do you mean, Phil? <laughs> well, when I asked her for it, the first name Ellis popped out, too. Mm-hmm. There was no legitimate way for her to know that you gave me the full name over the phone, but I only gave her Clay. That was an opening, but I needed proof. Mm-hmm. So you needled her until she made a break. Mm. Then you walked into the gun she grabbed. Uh, you take some long chances, Phil. Oh, oh, I'll do anything to see justice prevail, Ibarra. I smell a rat. You should. I emptied the gun <laughs> when she was phoning. <laughs> Good night, Phil. Good morning, Ibarra. I left police headquarters and walked to my car. First gray streaks of a new day were breaking in the east. Should have given me a lift, but it didn't. Now it was time for me to go home and go to bed, but instead I sat in my car with the door open and smoked a cigarette while I watched the dawn come up. I couldn't help thinking what an odd trick nature plays on us. Some of the most beautiful creatures most deadly. For instance, Ruth. How soft and sweet and lovely she was. And how hard she could swing a tire iron. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Paul Fries, Yvonne Patey, Jack Moyles, and Jerry Hausner. Detective Lieutenant Ibarra is played by Jeff Corey. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was hot and still. An August night in the middle of April... But that didn't matter to the striptease dancer in the golden mask. Because murder made her blood run cold the night the heat waves struck. There will be more dramatic excitement of the chase tomorrow on CBS's two Sunday shows, Broadway is My Beat and The Adventures of Sam Spade. Broadway is My Beat brings you the adventures of Danny Clover, whose beat is the great white way and whose cases involve a vast, strange assortment of Broadway characters. Later, Dashiell Hammett's great detective, Sam Spade, cuts another caper surrounded by mystery and mayhem in the grand style. The adventures of Sam Spade and Broadway is My Beat are regular Sunday features on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.